With the holiday season upon us, I'm going to discuss symbolism in the Word of God today as it relates to the birth of Jesus Christ and some of the other common symbols that we associate with this time of year. So I'd like for everybody to go in their Bibles to Luke chapter 2, or you can look at the screen. I'm going to read verses 4 through 7. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was, that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Uh, I want to clarify in the first verse, verse 4, um, God's word does have symbols above the vowels in the words wet, which is assumed to be went, and fro, which typically means from. Uh, so I put those symbols in so that you realize they're not necessarily typos, but they were used intentionally by the translators or the printers when they went to print the word of God. So here we pick up some doctrines. Uh, first of all, Jesus Christ was her firstborn son. Mary had other children, uh, but God makes it very clear this is her firstborn son. And uh, we know from studying the Bible, there's a great significance there. But first I'd like to say the world celebrates the holiday season, which has an abundance of pagan traditions. We know that. How do we as Christians have joy this time of year? We can have joy because if we study the Bible and we know the precepts of Jesus Christ, uh, we can get a spiritual understanding of his birth and the related events, events, and we can look around us and see that everything was made by God for his pleasure. And you can have great joy during this time of year like you can any time of year. Uh, don't let the world get you down. Rather, uh, celebrate uh, you know, the joy of being saved. And this is a great time of year to study the birth of Jesus Christ, as any time would be. So the purpose of this sermon today is to co cover selected symbols and characters associated with Christmas, uh, discuss spiritual meanings of each character, uh, facts about God's word as it relates to the birth of Jesus Christ, and then I'm going to give a brief conclusion. First of all, the symbols. Uh, we've got in a typical nativity set, which I'm sure everyone listening has seen a nativity set. Uh, maybe there's an exception out there. I don't know. I know I was raised with nativity sets uh, placed in the room where our Christmas tree was, and you see symbols uh, little figurines of the baby Jesus, Mary, Joseph, wise men, shepherds, sheep, asses, an angel, oxen. You know, it varies from set to set, but these are common symbols that are placed in nativity sets. And if you think about it, you know, centuries and centuries ago, perhaps this was an effective way to teach people about the gospel. But today we can't get carried away and base our doctrine off of a nativity set. We need to know what the Word of God says and, uh, and live in this world, although we're not part of this world, and not be harmed by anything because we believe on Jesus Christ. So I'm just going to discuss the spiritual meaning. Uh, Jesus Christ is the Word made flesh. He is the Most High God. He and the Father are one. And he is the only offering for salvation. So the birth of Jesus Christ is great news to the world because God will tell us in Hebrews chapter 10 that there is no other offering for sin except believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so this is really a joyful time, any time, that we can uh, discuss Jesus Christ. The only offering for salvation is a time to be really joyful if you're born again. And if uh, you're not born again, it's an opportunity to believe on Jesus Christ, believe in the Word of God with all your heart, and you shall be saved if you're a true believer. Mary is a believer symbolically of low estate. I've put some cross-references there, but 
you know, God chooses people, and Mary had low estate. She didn't have a lot of pride or a big ego. We don't know much about her appearance, uh, but God found favor in, in her. Uh, Joseph was a believer of great faith. He was told, you know, uh, by God in a dream uh, of what would happen, and uh, he had to, you know, face some realities that his uh, young wife was pregnant, but it wasn't his child. And that would be extremely hard for, for, you know, for people in that situation to accept. But Joseph was a man of faith. The wise men were believers. Uh, they were wise because of God saying they were wise. They did not necessarily have the world's wisdom, which is in rebellion against God. But they were wise men, and they spiritually were symbolic of believers. Shepherds are symbolic of church leaders or believers Throughout the Bible, and in most cases, not all, the shepherds fail miserably because, you know, we as a people uh, get off track. Um, and we always, or oftentimes, don't always listen to God. We don't obey the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ at times. And when you're uh, in a position of leadership as a Christian, that can become a snare very easily. Uh, sheep are believers. I cited John chapter 10 there. You guys can use all these references uh, for study purposes, and I hope you'll find them beneficial. Asses are stubborn, professing believers. People, people that are not necessarily saved, they're still in the world, so to speak, Babylon, but they profess some type of belief. And they're stubborn and rebellious, and God is calling them out of the world. Uh, but they have to shed their pride and their stubbornness in order to become saved. Gold is symbolic of wisdom. So when the wise men brought gold, uh, there's a number of levels of truth there. Uh, certainly, Joseph and Mary would have needed gold because they just got done paying taxes. So that would help them from an economic standpoint. But it's also symbolic of when you come to Jesus Christ, you have to, when, when you're given permission by God the Father to come to Jesus Christ, you have to shed your own wisdom. You have to give up what you believe the truth is and accept Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, God's wisdom is uh, completely different from men's wisdom. You have to be emptied as a vessel, get rid of your own ideas, and let God fill you um, with his wisdom. Uh, you can study that. I gave a reference in Proverbs chapter 16. Myrrh represents death or sacrifice. Frankincense, prayers or sacrifice. A tree is symbolic of a person. An ornament is symbolic of wisdom, belief, and faith. A gift is salvation. And a fireplace is symbolic of where you would find God's word, like a Bible. So I gave cross-references, but I'd like everybody to remember that uh, these uh, items that I just uh, described, they can be good, you can have good gold, or you can have bad gold, fool's gold. Uh, the same with a good tree or a bad tree, a good ornament or a bad ornament, a good gift or a bad gift. Uh, it goes both ways because the God of the world wants to emulate and be like the Most High. So you have to read and study your Bible so that you understand what God is speaking to the Christian church through the Holy Spirit. But I hope this gives you just a refresher of spiritual vocabulary for this time of year when the world, uh, many in the world, celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. So, true or false, the Bible says three wise men gave gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. A lot of times I've heard growing up, and I didn't get saved in, until probably, oh, 14 years ago or so, but uh, I always was told that there's three wise men. There's Christian hymns about it, three kings, and uh, every nativity set that I've seen has had three wise men uh, as part of it. But there's no record that three was the number. It's just commonly associated because the gifts that were named, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, are three different unique gifts. But there could have been two wise men. There could have been 20. We don't know. But three is what's commonly used to teach because of the number of gifts, but it's not necessarily the number of wise men. 
Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem to participate in a census. I don't know how many Christians, or people at least that profess to be Christians, I would say 9 out of 10 in my life uh, that I've talked to, uh, have explained to me that there was a census going on and Joseph and Mary had to participate in it. Well, God's word doesn't say anything about this. Uh, what, what God's word says is that they went to pay taxes because Caesar, I think it was Caesar Augustus, uh, you know, put a, a tax in, in motion. Uh, that people had to come and pay taxes to him. And, you know, later on, Jesus talks to, I think it was Peter, about, you know, is it lawful to pay tribute to Caesar? Uh, we're reminded that we are to obey the statutes and secular powers that are put in place as long as they don't go against the Most High God. And Joseph and Mary were certainly under, um, you know, they were obedient to the secular laws. They, they paid their taxes. And it's a reminder for us, and God uses the word tax at least five times, and I believe it's in Luke chapter 2. Uh, Mary offered two turtle doves, or two young pigeons, to atone for her sins after Jesus was born. That's a very important doctrine because, um, you know, Catholics are taught that Mary was born sinless. Uh, it's the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, that she was born without any sin, which God specifically says didn't happen because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. And Mary was under the law of Moses, and she needed to sacrifice um, based on the law of Moses. And she was a sinner like the rest of us are. Everybody in the flesh is not justified by the law. So that was a very true event that happened, and you can study the uh, accounts uh, in the Gospels uh, further on that one. Jesus was Mary's firstborn, Luke chapter 2, verse 7. He was visited and given gifts while his family was in a manger. Well, I was taught this as a kid, that Jesus and his family were in a manger, and I, never, I always thought a manger was like a little stable or, you know, some uh, very primitive form of a, like a port that had just a roof to it but no sides. Um, the other words I put here were house or hospital or something else, but if you read God's word, it says in Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. By the time the wise men uh, show up and bring their gifts, Mary is in a house with the young Jesus Christ. And they didn't visit her in a manger or a stable. She was in a house. And that's important to understand, as I'll get to in a couple slides here. Jesus was worshipped in a house, but was laid in a manger. Well, what is a manger? And I never really understood this as a kid. Uh, Luke chapter 2, And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. A manger is like a feeding trough for animals. Now that's critical because of what God says throughout the rest of Scripture. Uh, Jesus was worshipped in a house, and a house is symbolic of faith. It says that in the New Testament, the household of faith. Um, and that's where people worship Jesus. When they get born again of the Spirit, it's because they had faith. There is a spiritual household that we're part of. But he was placed in a manger, which is a feeding place for the children of Israel, per Isaiah chapter 1, verse 3, and John chapter 6, verse 53. You have to dine on Jesus, eat his flesh, and drink his blood spiritually, which is the word of God. He is the word of God. And that means when you read the word of God, you're consuming that with faith. You believe the words. You don't have doubt in your heart. You trust that God's word is true and pure and that the Holy Spirit is going to lead you to all truth. And, uh, and it will be a process. The body of believers indwelt with the Holy Spirit, uh, Jerusalem ab from above, will you know the, they will edify one another. The body of believers edify one another through the gifts of the Holy Ghost. We're not learning fleshly things through intellectual power. 
we're learning spiritual things made possible by the Holy Ghost. So in Luke chapter 2, it says there was no room for them in the inn. The inn represents a bigger venue, uh, a wide house for many, uh, where many people could stay, certainly more than a, a small house, and there was no room. The inn is symbolic of the world. Jesus is hated by the world. Uh, but fortunately, he was located to a house, and if you go to Proverbs 21, verse 9, you know, it might be possible that Jesus Christ was placed in the corner of the second level of the house, as stated in Proverbs. You know, it's possible. I'm not going to make a big doctrine about it, but the Word of God has so much depth and meaning into it, you can learn more and more about uh, the importance of all the symbols in the account of the birth of Jesus Christ by studying the entire canon of Scripture. So where do the animals in a nativity set come from? Uh, you know, other passages such as Isaiah chapter 1 verse 3, the ox knoweth his owner and the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Because we're a stubborn and rebellious people that need to be called out of our pride. And God the Father, if we, if, if he prepares our hearts and takes the hardness off them, will allow us to come to faith. But we have to believe the word of God. We have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and that his word is true. So animals, as mentioned earlier, are certainly symbolic of people. And you can have a, a, you know, a, a variety of different types of animals, as we know from reading the canon of Scripture. Some people say the Gospels conflict because there is a star in Matthew, but none in Luke. Is this really a conflict between the two? No, because the Gospel is testified through many other places in Scripture. And you have to understand the entire canon of Scripture. But it says in Luke that a star appeared, and if we go to the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 1, verse 20, stars are the angels. So we know that you know, the gospel is giving us an account in Matthew and Luke of the same thing, but the angel is described as a star rather than the angel that is said in the book of Matthew. That's all. So detractors like to uh, use those types of things to say that the Bible conflicts its with itself. And, you know, they, first of all, those people, they don't have the word of God to begin with. They're using corrupted scriptures. And secondly, they don't understand spiritual things. So, to conclude, how do you have joy in a season of worldly meanings? How do you really have joy this time of year? You know that the world has uh, done everything possible to paganize uh, the time of year when Christians and professing Christians alike celebrate the birth of Jesus, which you could do at any time, but for the sake of, of having joy, this is as good a time of, of any to, as any to study the account of the birth of Jesus Christ. But you have to know what the Word of God says. And if you know what the Word of God says, you can have joy. You can look at a, at a tree with ornaments on it and understand that that's symbolic of a person that has either has God's wisdom or the wisdom of the world on them. And a green tree or a dry tree could be a good or bad thing. If you are green because you're watered with miry water, that's bad. If you're a green tree that is uh, being watered with pure water, uh, that is good. The same with the dry tree. You know, you have to be dried out and God has to empty you of all your worldly wisdom before you can be born again. You have to uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, believe in his word because it conflicts wildly with what we're taught in many cases, not all. And uh, God will fill us with wisdom and understanding, and we'll be able to, um, you know, enjoy the rest of our lives as we walk in the Spirit and uh, know that our flesh is not justified and will not be counted against us. If we get out of hand in the flesh, God will correct us because he loves us. With that said, uh, have joy this time of year, and I will continue this subject matter next week. Uh, until then, God bless everyone, and I'll talk then.